everybody. I am Erin Ryan. I'm one of the contributing editors to Daily Beast, and with me is Julie Cohen, one of the directors of the film that you just saw. Um, so we're just gonna we're just gonna talk for a few minutes, and then we'll take some questions, and then uh, there'll be merch, I believe. There's going to be some merch toss There's for those who uh, stick around. Some free merch tossing. Julie is going to so Julie is going to throw. Just saying, no, I, th I think uh, Tess Ornstein from Magnolia is the designated uh, merch tosser. So okay. uh, so Tess is going to throw some shit at you <laughs> if you stick around for long enough. Um, so Julie, first thing I want to talk about is this: this movie is an incredible portrait of an incredible woman, and it was brought to us by a team that involved a lot of incredible women. Uh, that's right. We're quite proud that um, all the lead creative and executive roles uh, in our film were held by women. That was an intentional choice because uh, <laughs> Betsy and I were women making a film about a woman who spent has spent her life in the slow, steady battle for women's rights. So why not bring a lot of women into play in uh, making the film? and. Uh, the light is bright enough that I'm not entirely sure that I'm getting everyone, but I do want to recognize at least two of those fantastic women, Nadine Nator and Grace Mendenhall, who are here with us uh, tonight, associate producer and associate editor. If you want to stand up and take a bow, no one would begrudge you that. <laughs> Woo! That's awesome. And if I'm missing somebody, y you can yell out your name and I'll admit <laughs> that you're here, but don't pretend that you worked on our film if you didn't. Oh my gosh, Claudia Roschke, our, our director of photography. Didn't know you were here, Claudia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask is, is why did you decide to make this film now at this exact moment? Well, you know, we actually didn't decide to make the film now. We decided to make this film uh, in January of 2015. Um, it was a time when the notorious RBG sort of phenomenon was just getting into high gear. And myself and my directing partner, Betsy, who had each interviewed Justice Ginsburg for two previous projects, uh, weirdly enough, uh, saw the obsession with her among millennials, the you know stuff you saw in the film, the t-shirts, the tote bags, the, I don't want to give away, that's like a spoiler alert for the merch, but um, <laughs> the, uh, the tattoos. And we actually knew Justice Ginsburg's story was a lot bigger and better and cooler and more amazing than even some of the you know RBG fans knew. So just thought like, hey, let's make a documentary about her um, and shouldn't, shouldn't we be the people to do it? Uh, interestingly, one of our concerns at the time that we started uh, the project was like, are we a little bit too late? Like is, is Justice Ginsburg, like is this the peak of her fame and is she gonna start to seem less relevant by the time we could get a film out? Like little did we know uh, things that were gonna happen in the country in the intervening years that in fact would make her more relevant uh, than ever. Uh, we might have hoped to get our film out quicker, but um, Justice Ginsburg herself, as you saw in the film, is a fan of sort of slow, steady progress. <laughs> so when we initially approached her in January 2015 with a sort of substantial uh, email laying out what we wanted to do, she sent us back a response pretty quickly that essentially said, not yet. Um, we know she's a woman who chooses her words carefully. We looked over her email very carefully and we noticed that two words that were not in it were no and never. Uh, so we took that as a sign to move forward. Um, and it was sort of an incremental complicated process, but over about a year and a half, um, we got her on board with um, us doing the project and then it took us a year and a half to make the film. Um, it's fascinating that she uses email. I would think of her as more of a Snapchat person. <laughs> um, yes, well, actually to say that she uses email would be something of uh, something of an exaggeration. Um, there's a process. When you send her an email, generally it gets everything goes through an assistant who prints it out, gives it to her, she reads it overnight. She generally uh, may, gives responses in one of three ways. She either dicta dictates an email response, which we got a number of, 
um, or sends a type response that also uh, an assistant is typing up, or she's a big fan of the handwritten note. So um, we've gotten a number of handwritten notes from the justice, which obviously is super cool. Have you framed any of them? Um, yes. What? <laughs> so which which is your most prized framed? Ginsburg okay, note. this gets a little complicated, but um, the previous project, which I mentioned uh, that I interviewed the justice for, was um, about the Lower East Side smoked fish store Russ and Daughters, of which the justice is a big fan. It was called The Sturgeon Queens, and after I interviewed her for that uh, film, she basically sent me not one but two separate notes that said kind of like thanks for the locks because I brought her some locks. She didn't really mention the film or the interview. She was just like went on and on about how delicious like the, <laughs> the, the locks were and how much she enjoyed it and who she planned to eat it with, and I have, <laughs> do have that matted. I didn't think I could love her more, um, and, and I do now. Uh, why do you think that millennial women specifically, but millennials in general, find her so compelling? Yeah, I almost feel like I'm ca calling up some audience members to answer that question, but I will, I will try myself. Um, you know, I think it's a combination of things. There's... It's kind of one part, it's kind of half ironic joke, like isn't it cool and funky that we're celebrating as a rock star this teeny little 85-year-old grandma whose whole thing is writing very carefully thought out intellectual legal opinions and dissents. So that's sort of like the, the joke and irony part, but you know, behind that there's a real core of substance. Um, this is someone and a soft-spoken woman at that who's faced a lot of opposition but who's dealt with it by calmly and quietly but really, really strongly speaking up and speaking back. And I think that just really resonates with people, especially right now when there's a lot people feel bombarded with that they kind of like to... They, they, that, that like we all kind of wish we could speak back to as calmly and eloquently as the justice does. So it's kind of like she's giving voice to that, that impulse. Do you think that it's also that she lived through periods of time that we saw in the film where she was one of, I think, how many, nine yeah, women nine in, class in, of 500. in her class at Harvard, and she was told that she was taking a man's place and she had a hard time getting a job despite her massive amounts of intelligence. And she saw through all these cases so th th that sort of represented this extreme advancement for women. Do you think that her existence as a sort of reminder of how bad things were recently is, is one of the reasons she has such staying power? Yes. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I also thought was really interesting about the film, and we've we've chatted about this before, but her husband, Marty, has been sort of a really important part of her life and her career. What did you learn about their relationship as you were making the film? Absolutely. I mean, Marty is just huge in her life. We understood going into this project that Justice Ginsburg had had a long and happy marriage. Unfortunately, Marty had passed away, you know, sev several years before we started filming, but we didn't realize how big a part of, you know, her life, her career, her very soul and being he was. Um, I would say that literally every single person we interviewed talked extensively about Marty. When we would ask about Ruth, it's like you almost can't understand her without understanding him and that relationship and that support system and symbiosis that was really such a such a beautiful thing. I mean, we have in some of our early festival screenings, we've gotten some super political crowds where we've even been questioned sometimes like, but this is supposed to be a feminist story. Like, why is there so much about a man in it? But, you know, to, to us, like, this is a beautiful feminist story love story, the kind of story that you wish there were more of. It's kind of turning on its head the whole notion of like, oh, behind every great man you've got this supportive wife figure. Well, here you had a woman who was kind of equipped to reach the highest levels of her profession and was able to do it in part because she had a guy standing behind her who was so on board, you know, logistically, emotionally, in terms of time and stepping in with childcare and cooking and everything. He was just like so on board to play the role. And 
she got to where she is, you know, in part because of him. Partly because she worked hard, partly because she was brilliant herself, but like also like he played a real role like in, in every way. And to me that's like a beautiful story and not anything to to shy away from. I mean that that, that was a kind of a part of the story that kept expanding. I mean those who are in the room who were part of this film com coming together know that like basically every time that there was a scene that um, you know that would be edited actually the very first scene of the of the film that was put together that our great editor Carla Gutierrez uh, cut was like that three minute sequence early on where she's saying what was it about Marty and then she sort of has this whole reverie where we go back to the home movies and you sort of see them together and every time we would see a scene with Marty like everyone and we had um, women of a number of different generations working uh, working on the film, but we would all be like, oh, <laughs> you know, it, just, it was just like, it was so, it just like reached a core, and so it kept getting bigger and bigger. Um, one of the things that I also noticed watching the film was how much respect she commanded from men who even were ideologically different from her. Can you talk a little bit about like Orrin Hatch and Antonin Scalia and, and the way that they fostered such a deep admiration for her intelligence? Yeah, I mean, I think some, something about it is just an aura that the justice has. It's a little hard to describe until you've spent some time with her. She's, you know, she's very small and soft-spoken, but she's, she's really commands, she has a really commanding presence, sort of like a star power. Her childhood friends talked about her in that way too, which we thought was interesting, like a little bit intimidating and very reserved. But like when she spoke, like everyone kind of listened. She just has this way of really engaging people. It's like a, it's a very quiet charisma, but it is a charisma. And um, you know, a number of uh, men through the years and women as well just se seem to really uh, like her. I mean, you know, something that's, uh, Orrin Hatch, I mean, you heard how respectfully and uh, admiringly he spoke of her. Truthfully, by the end of that interview, he has said, not only I love Ruth Bader Ginsburg, a, a, a soundbite that didn't quite make it in the film because it seemed like a little weird or off base, but also he called her, he called her cute twice. So I don't know, make, make of that what you will. Uh, <laughs> How adorable for him to say that. <laughs> one, one of the other things that I, that I thought was really interesting about the film was uh, the part where she was working out wearing a super diva sweatshirt. And uh, I know that's not like super serious in terms of her impressive legal career, but I really would love for you to share the backstory of why she was wearing that in the workout scene. Well, you know, obviously she knew that we were going to be filming uh, that workout scene. That was the first time um, that she had been on camera at all doing her exercise routine with her trainer, Brian Johnson. Um, some of you probably saw that she did a workout uh, several months uh, later with Stephen Colbert, where she was actually wearing a different version of a Super Diva t-shirt. So, like, clearly it was an intentional choice on her part what to wear. That shirt was a gift. Uh, from the Washington National Opera after she did the performance that you saw as the Duchess of Krakenthorpe. I mean, a as you know, she, and, and as she said, I mean, we included in the film, but she said this repeatedly, like, and not, not really jokingly, like, if she had her druthers, like, her ultimate career choice would be to be a great opera singer. She just didn't have the singing talent. She actually talks in more detail about what a bad singer she is, it sort of fits in with cooking as things that she's not, um, not a genius at. Uh, and, you know, in, in her own way, she's got, had the opportunity to be a diva, and the Washington National Opera, after that performance, chose to honor her um, with that sweatshirt. It's amazing. Um, we were so, can I just say when we showed up in the gym that day and so because we were part of like the question was what will she be wearing yeah. and there she was with those little kind of striped sweatpants and her sneakers and we, she turned around and she's got this super diva exclamation. We're like okay this is like this is good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that I because I've seen I've watched the film a couple times now and watching it I kind of oscillate between being hopeful and sad. How do you feel after having made a film about Ruth Bader Ginsburg? Do you feel hopeful about the future or do you feel sad that she's 85 years old? 
Uh, no, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna follow the justice's lead and go with hopeful. She's spent a lifetime sort of choosing optimism, um, and it's worked really well for her. So I'll go with hopeful. Okay, one more thing. One more question before we turn it over to the audience. Um, is there anything that you really wanted to include in the film that you weren't able to include? You know, the, the, fir the first answer to that and I is that there's a part and, you know, many people in this uh, room that also work in uh, journalistic circles know that kind of like when you don't include stuff, you end up, there's like an amnesia side to it where like you kind of never want to think about it again. But upon, uh, Th upon reflection on that on that question, you know, one thing that um, that came up in uh, some of the justices' talks and that Justice Scalia liked to talk about is that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, on a vacation, uh, saw some parasailers and chose to go parasailing. Um, so we did our our due diligence of trying to see whether there were any photos or footage of the justice. Uh, Parasailing, she sort of isn't parasailing presently, so the opportunity for Claudia to go uh, sh shoot her doing some parasailing wasn't uh, wasn't in the cards. But um, you know, yes, we, we wish um, we wish there were footage of the justice parasailing we'll for just our movie. Just have to imagine it. Yes, try to imagine <laughs> it. Um, were there any areas in her life that you wanted to capture but weren't really able to in the film, or it didn't fit? Uh, areas or like eras, different eras. different well, parts of the life. Well, you know, there's a there was a random period uh, between the time that she um, wasn't getting jobs in law firms. She also uh, was a, d did do a, a clerkship for a federal judge and before, um, before she went to the ACLU around the time that she was a professor, she went to Sweden for a few months to like write a textbook about comparative law. She learned Swedish and like went to Sweden. <laughs> it's like, you know, it's fascinating, but it seemed so random and off course that we didn't include it in the film. Tr truthfully, recently, Betsy and I have jokingly sort of been talking about like, oh, we should do a short, like, you know, RBG, the Sweden years. <laughs> so you can, uh, you can watch for that um, in the coming years. I would 100% watch that. And it's gonna be, it'll be like in Swedish with subtitles. It's fine, I would learn, I would learn Swedish to watch that film. <laughs> Um, I think that's all the time we have, but we wanted to turn it out over to the crowd for questions, if anybody had anything. Can you tell us a little more about her kids? Sure. What do they do? Are sure, they sure. That, uh, yeah. Um, so Justice Ginsburg's uh, grown children, uh, Jane, is a professor at Columbia Law School, um, specializes in intellectual property, and, uh, you know, obviously an incredibly successful, esteemed uh, professor, has been there for quite some time. Um, and Jim uh, went to law school but didn't finish because he moved into the other uh, kind of area of family I interest, which is classical music, and he is a classical music produ uh, uh, producer who has his own company in Chicago. It's called CD uh, Records, and actually his wife, who's an opera singer, um, again, fitting in the family, uh, has uh, business-ish, has just put out uh, a CD that's called the Notorious RBG in Song. That's kind of like a, it's like a, it's like a avant-garde. It's like modern classical, like r connected to her descents. It's like pretty interesting. If you're into, if you're into, if you're into modern classical, I would definitely recommend uh, getting getting a copy. We won't be that, but we're not. It's not part of the merch toss, though. <laughs> Um, I have a question about the years that she was trying to break into law. Do you know what kind of law she was intending to practice? And did she ever comment on the fact that if she was able to practice that kind of law, her career might not have taken the trajectory it did? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yes, Justice Ginsburg has has absolutely made the point. Um, it was sort some kind of big time Wall Streety corporate firms that she was looking at. You know, probably also not with that much enthusiasm. It was the general way of that era that women just weren't getting associate jobs at law firms. I mean, Sandra Day O'Connor around the same time, uh, but in other locations had has a more complicated story that involves like literally dozens of uh, law firms that she pursued and didn't get jobs at. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, tried a few, was getting turned down, got the vibe like this isn't happening and decided to go another direction through a, a Columbia professor of hers. She uh, got, got the clerkship she got, and she has made the very point that you're making that, you know, I could have just ended up, 
you know, a partner in a New York City law firm and done really well at that, and that wouldn't I wouldn't have propelled me in the direction of um, you know that I ultimately got to of becoming a Supreme Court justice. So. Uh, you know, she, she, she tends to see the bright side of things, and she definitely sees the bright side of that, too. She would now say it's for the best that she didn't uh, get those jobs. Also, um, so like as a millennial woman, my question is, how do you think Justice Ginsburg would want women to carry her legacy forward? And in a lot of ways, she like has continued with some traditional forces of having a family. So how would you go forward as a woman, as a millennial, carrying that forward. Yeah, you know, it's kind of hard to speak for someone, but from what I've heard the justice say on that question, I mean, first of all, she's very much in favor of the idea of millennial women carrying on the tradition of activism that she started in the 70s, um, you know, particularly through the system and and in the in the courts, et cetera. She uh, has said recently, since we kind of finished the, the film, she's, she's pointed out that she's very much in favor of the Me Too movement and Time's Up and watching that with great interest. And in terms of, she also says that she feels like the big direction that still, the, the, the area that still needs a lot of improvement is what you'd call sort of work-life balance issues and the extent to which, I mean, law is her world, so she's talked a fair amount about law firms doing more to accommodate uh, working mothers. Um, I know that's a big interest of hers and think something that she feels like um, is, is worth pushing both uh, from the women that are in the situation, the men around them, and the whole uh, power structure. All right, I think that's all the time we have for questions from you guys, but now it's, now it's, it's merch o'clock. And while we're, while we're merching, as we, as we merch, um, we should also point out that you know this, this is the opening night of this film. Uh, we're in 10 cities this weekend, broadening out over the next couple weekends. Please, please, please tell your friends, when you, when you tweet with the hashtag RBGMovie, the most amazing icon of Justice Ginsburg, complete with a jabo and a gavel and the glasses and the whole thing like magically pops up on Twitter. If you go on Lyft and put in code RBG, you will get like a little RBG icon instead of a car coming to get you, which is like so much fun that you're gonna wanna take rides just to do that. Uh, she, she, uh. Wait, no, she will not. She will not be driving. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, as a New York City girl, like I don't. I'm not sure. She, she certainly. I, I don't. I don't know that she drives. I'm not sure if she ever. She certainly doesn't drive now, and I, I don't think driving is her thing. So no. Have to put that in the sequel. Uh, but you know. But more, more seriously, please tell your friends. You know, Mother's Day weekend. We really want people bringing their moms, bringing their daughters and sons. Way to go, uh, Fox Washburn, <laughs> Silas <laughs> Arlo. <laughs> Um, well, Julie, thank you for making the film. I loved it, and I think everybody here loved it, too. All right, thank you guys thank you very so much. much for coming. Love you. <laughs>